All right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Doug Cluck. I work for the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here out of Kansas City. Um, I'm the Regional Climate Services Director for the North Central part of the U.S. And we're going to be talking uh, about the North Central U.S. climate and drought outlook here in just a moment. Uh, today we have two speakers and thus we're going to go a little bit long. So um, those of you who want to sign off can do that, of course. So I'm, we're expecting it'll take a little more than two hours, especially if we have a bunch of questions. And we may, because uh, not only um, uh, is it October and the end of the growing season and all that great stuff, and we're going to be reporting on that. Our second speaker, Brad Rippey, with the USDA, is going to be talking about sort of climate and agriculture as it adds up as it has added up this year, uh, especially focused on the North Central U.S., our first speaker is going to be our typical uh, talk about the climate. Um, there may be questions about that. There may be questions about El Nino, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, don't be shy. Uh, go ahead and put those not into the question or into the question uh, uh, interface down there on, on your thing. And we'll, we'll get to those questions either during or uh, later. Um, I think that's about it. Laura is the state climatologist for South Dakota. She's going to kick off our uh, presentation today. Again, you can ask questions anytime on that in the question box. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. Uh, Dennis, anything else? I, I think that's it. Dennis, I should also say Dennis Toddy from the USDA Climate Hub out of the Midwest is co-hosting this with me. So take it away, Laura. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doug, for the introduction. Um, apologize in advance, I have a little tickle in my throat today, but um, I'm gonna try to talk fast and get through uh, all the things to talk about, as Doug said. Um, <clears throat> we had a, a pretty unique visitor here. I'm in Aberdeen, South Dakota, in the north central, northeastern part of the state. And a week and a half ago, we had this moose come through the neighborhood. This is about a half mile from my house and out on the farm and uh, was just hanging around the soybean field. Not very unusual or not very usual for around here um and definitely no hunting season for that so we will get to it that's just kind of a fun story um here we have a number of links to the past recorded presentations and after today's recording is is finished uh, that will be posted also on those two links right there at the top at the regional climate centers both in the midwest and the high plains region and several links to other resources, some of which uh, we're using here today in this presentation. Um, we are in the fall season and it's pumpkin time and some great news out of Minnesota, uh, a guy from Anoka County, just north of the Twin Cities, uh, grew the record breaking 2,749 pound pumpkin that was just weighed last week in California. Um, but you know, Illinois, generally grows the most pumpkins and a lot of those go towards the canned pumpkin products that you guys know um, in indiana though um, also produces a lot of other pumpkins for about 30 million dollars of um, production of pumpkins so a lot of pumpkins growing up in this region and i know around here it's been a pretty good year indiana i understand is maybe a week or two behind on their harvest it's been kind of slow and that has been similar in some other crops too that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so our agenda for today, we'll first talk about kind of some recent conditions over the last month in the growing season since Brad Rippey is going to talk about kind of the agriculture side. Uh, after me, I'll talk about some growing season climate pieces as well. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the impacts that we've heard from around the region and the outlooks, which is the highly anticipated part of the talk, I'm sure. So first, just talking about the uh, recent history here, September overall that month, um, very warm on some parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin. The red areas, those are counties, red counties, the warmest September on record in 129 years. But there's a lot, a lot of other counties across the north central states that had their top 10, uh, 10 percentile warmest September's as well, so really quite warm across the region. If we look, think back to uh, Labor Day weekend, that was very warm. That was presented in the last uh, last month's briefing, but then also at the end of the month, September 30th, and into October, um, also was quite warm uh, across the region. 
Uh, looking at the growing season overall, the last six months, um, f the last six full months, so April through September, uh, again, generally warm across the western and northern part of our region here in the north central states, but more uh, near normal to cool in the eastern, southeastern part of our region, you know, including um, Ohio, Indiana, um, and Kentucky around that area, around the Ohio River Valley. So kind of a warmer and cooler uh, on both sides of the region, depending where you are. And certainly the, the cooler areas in the east have um, slowed down, you know, the accumulation of growing degree days or growing degree day units, um, however you describe that, and really slowed maturity, um, the, slowed down the timeline for those crops to get to maturity this year, um, kind of delaying some of the harvest activities as well. But I think things are picking up from what we hear from our colleagues out in that region. Uh, September overall, looking at precipitation this time, and here we're looking at, again, kind of haves and have-nots of precipitation. Uh, no record wettest Septembers uh, in the region, but some in the top 10 percentile, including some areas of the Dakotas, Minnesota, um, around that region where you see those uh, darker green areas. Um, but also some very dry areas, northeastern Ohio, record driest in some of those counties, or northern Ohio, um, right along the Great Lakes area. Um, several others in the top 10th percentile for the driest September on record. When you look um, from uh, northern Missouri all the way over to the east and up through Michigan. So um, really kind of a difference between west and east, again, on the precipitation side for September. Uh, on the growing season side, um, or length, looking at the last six full months, again, April through September, um, generally wetter than average uh, in the Dakotas, Wyoming, Montana, um, and then dry in the central and eastern side, essentially most of the bulk of the Corn Belt region. You see some individual counties in Iowa there did record their driest April through September on record in 129 years. You see a handful of counties there. And um, I, that has been reflected, I think, throughout the growing season and drought, uh, drought monitor and crop condition uh, throughout the season. Just look at the last 30 days. So since our last webinar, more or less, uh, of this meeting, uh, looking at temperature departure from average temperature, of course, this includes the very hot period at the end of September, early October, um, but in general, temperatures above average across the region. So that has helped, especially again, the Eastern Core Belt uh, get those crops, not just corn, but all those crops uh, up to maturity. Um, further west in the, in the Dakotas and so on, we've been above average for growing degree day units essentially since May. And uh, really this just kept that trend going, um, ending last week, you know, a couple hundred, a few hundred degree, degree day units above average for the season. <clears throat> On the side of precipitation over the last 30 days, we've had a couple big events um, that have brought some significant rainfall, especially to South Central South Dakota, Northern Nebraska, and parts of Minnesota around the Twin Cities and just north of there between the Twin Cities and Duluth. Uh, where you see some high totals there in the seven to nine to and higher range, there were some 10 inch reports um, of a couple, like a couple multi-day events, um, or I should say one multi-day event in Northern Nebraska for sure. Um, that was reported by a couple of different folks and radar. And so certainly these areas have replenished soil moisture. These areas in the purples have been affected by drought a uh, for quite a while here over, over the season and over the year. And um, although there was some short-term flooding uh, and some rises in rivers, a lot of that moisture went into replenishing our soil moisture side of, the, of things. And we saw um, some improvements in drought as we'll see in a little bit. We look at the last 30 days, um, looking at which areas were wetter or drier as compared to average. Um, certainly those hotspots show up in South Dakota, Nebraska, and Minnesota, but there are actually quite a few areas 
in the north and west of this of this region that were above average for precipitation in the last 30 days. Um, but as you look further south um, from southern Iowa down into Missouri, much of Kansas and along the Ohio River Valley, those areas are still um, we're, we're drier than average uh, for for the last month. Some areas, you know, less than 25% of, of average, <clears throat> excuse me, for moisture uh, in the last 30 days. So certainly this has contributed to looking at our soil moisture situation um, where even though we've, um, again, like I said, over South Dakota, Nebraska, Minnesota, the last 30 days, we've seen um, some locally heavy rainfall, but soil moisture is not quite saturated in all those places. Um, Wyoming, as I think we heard the briefing last month, had been very wet, um, similar in western South Dakota, but as we look into basically the Mississippi River Valley um, and the Red River Valley in the north, in North Dakota, Minnesota, all the way down through that central part of the country, still retaining soils that are drier than average for this time of year, um, despite some of those locally uh, heavy rainfalls. So to look at the current drought picture, here's a map of the U.S. Drought Monitor just cut out to include our central region or north central region states here. And um, you can see this is from uh, this morning, the, the latest update. So you see some improvements across the region, um, but still eastern Iowa, um, southeastern Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, and the spot up in Wisconsin still holding on to the D3 to D4, so that uh, extreme to exceptional drought uh, designation in some of those areas. Uh, again, reflecting some of that long-term dryness um, in addition to the short-term dryness, especially in the southern part of the region. So right now across the region, we have um, about almost say almost 37 percent of the region in some level of drought um, that is uh, pretty close to where we were about three months ago um, one year ago however we had about 60 percent of the area of this region in drought of some level from d1 uh, through d4 so we have seen some improvements in the last year um, and if you guys remember, uh, you folks remember maybe from a year ago, we were really talking about drought and how concerned we were about some of the fall planted crops and the ability to regain some of that soil moisture that we typically get in the fall. So this year, it seems like we're in a little better situation as far as regionally goes, but certainly locally, there are some areas that are a little worse off this year than last year. Looking at just the last four weeks of changes in the drought monitor, we can look at this map to show us how many categories of change have we seen in the drought monitor. That would be look at the, the classes called D1, D2, D3, and D4, and so on. Um, generally, a lot of green in the map that shows improvements and some areas such as in Minnesota, Wisconsin have seen three class improvement over the last four weeks. Um, so that's almost like one category a week. Although we've seen down south and east, again, kind of reflecting the warmer, drier conditions, uh, worsening conditions of one to two categories in, in some of those areas. And that's just in the last month uh, since the last webinar, essentially. If we look at the growing season overall, this is since early May. Um, nationally speaking, uh, we were, at a minimum area of drought uh, at the end of May. So um, looking at the start of the growing season till now, we've seen actually generally worsening drought. Um, even though we've seen some recent short-term improvements, uh, say in Minnesota, Northern Iowa, in general, those areas are more drought, droughty now than they were um, at the beginning of May. Uh, some improvements. Again, in the western side of our region, in the western Dakotas, Nebraska, and so on, even though some of those areas are still carrying some signal of dryness or drought uh, in some, some of those areas. So to look at some of the impacts, uh, we'll kind of touch on the frost uh, dates for this year so far. That's the first picture, a, a picture of, I believe, I don't know if that's a zinnia, 
not sure, um, in Brookings, which is eastern South Dakota. A uh, corn picture of uh, ear of corn from corn harvest in southern Indiana. And then out um, in western South Dakota, that's uh, outdoor campus um, kind of outreach facility in the Rapid City area. So beautiful fall colors here just recently. First of all, I've kind of hinted at this, um, where we had some record high temperatures back on October 1st. Um, so this map is uh, showing what ranking each one of these stations had as far as their highest temperature that day. Everything in the maroon with the number one had a record high temperature for that day. Uh, and they see the twos would be the second warmest on record and so on. So a lot of top five record temperatures in this region, reaching up into the 90s, well into the 90s for a lot of the region. <clears throat> And looking at the cold side now, looking at the frost dates, um, the f date of the first 32 degree frost, um, you look at the different colors, that darkest green color is the first 10 days in October. And I think for a lot of those areas in the north central states, say in the Dakotas, Minnesota, Montana, a lot of that happened right on October 10th, maybe, um, right around there. Um, Curiously, there are some pockets that haven't seen a frost yet, such as the Twin Cities area um, and, and some other areas there in the, in the northern latitudes haven't quite seen that first frost yet. Just to compare to what our typical uh, first frost dates are, this is the typical date or the median date of our first 32 degree freeze. And so generally we see that up here in the northern region more in the late September timeframe. So it was a couple weeks later than typical um, for this year's frost so far, but we still have a lot of our region that hasn't seen uh, 32 degrees as a minimum temperature just yet. Um, and we're kind of in that middle middle part of the season where we would expect that um, as you get into that lighter green color, the middle to lighter green color, that's right around this time um, through October. Uh, looking at a killing frost or a hard freeze of 28 degrees, however you define that, um, we have had some areas that have reported that already here. Um, again, the green colors were some date in October and so we have seen some of that across the region, not as widespread as a 32 degree frost, but we have seen some areas like that. And again, just to look at our typical 28 degree freeze date, um, a little bit later than typical in the Northwest in the Montana, North Dakota region, kind of near the typical day in South Dakota and Western Minnesota, uh, but we should, um, often we see that that 30, 20, sorry that 28 degree threshold being broken or being uh, approached around this time of year again in this mid to late October. So not too, we're not too much later than typical, right right around the probably the typical date if we were to see that soon. Um, changing tracks here to water a little bit, uh, Brad Rippey will talk more about the Mississippi River levels and those kinds of things. That's a big story, I think, right now. But looking at our average stream flow um, for the last 28 days, you see uh, some blues there. We're in the western part of the region where things have been wetter lately, um, but certainly a lot of maroons and oranges, uh, orange dots in the central part of the region, including a lot of Kansas and Iowa um, and uh, some areas along the Ohio River Valley. So we are running uh, below normal in, in a lot of those areas and that is causing some issues on the Mississippi River in particular. Um, the Missouri River, uh, that river is doing a little bit better um, for this time of year. But those maroon dots certainly are um, the lowest 10 percentile, so much below normal um, for this time of year. Uh, speaking of the Missouri River, um, so far the, the, the most recent update from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which manages the reservoirs in the Missouri River in the main stem, um, currently the system storage is about 54.2 million acre feet. Um, last year this time it was about 48 and change. So we're a little higher than last year at this time. Uh, September runoff um, in the upper basin, so that's the part of the river that's above Sioux City, Iowa, um, was a little bit above average um, for, for that month. 
the runoff forecast for the river is uh, still a little bit above average, about 29.1 million acre feet. So 113% of average. Um, they are gonna provide navigation support um, through the entire season through December 1. And that is all the way to the mouth of the Missouri. Um, that is based on their September 1 storage. And that's how they make that determination. And they will do winter releases from Gavin's Point Dam, which is a dam just above Sioux City, um, at least uh, 13,000 cubic feet per second. So they're gonna try to maintain that navigation season um, uh, through December 1st. And you can see the line here on the graph of 2023, that's the red line in the middle there, kind of goes up and the forecast is the black dotted line that continues on from there. So they're expecting above average um, system storage and uh, runoff this, this season. So just some highlights um, uh, of reports across the region. Very low, very low river levels in the Mississippi River record to near record. Um, and again, Brad will elaborate on that. Uh, we do have an upcoming storm system uh, coming through, which could increase our fire risk. Um, I'll talk about that in the outlook section. We have had some heavy rains, <clears throat> again, went to improving soil moisture, saw some short-term ponding and flooding, um, but still we have some huge deficits to overcome from the long-term. Uh, some of the harvested, some of the crop yields um, from harvested crops seem better than expected, um, but still many states are, are lower than what the trends would suggest, again, due to primarily drought in this growing season. Um, around here, winter wheat um, has been planted pretty much near near uh, typical planting rates and generally off to a good start with the emergence and so on in, in the Dakotas and Nebraska um, with recent rainfall especially. Although we are seeing some cattle moving quickly to grazing on those say harvested uh, corn stalks, uh, especially in those drought areas that have struggled with some of the grazing land and grass production. And just a couple notes about the Great Lakes, uh, the lakes themselves, uh, levels have come down, lake levels have come down from September, but that's still typical for this time of year. Um, and above average uh, currently for the month of October. Uh, currently water temperatures are a little bit warmer than average as well in the, in the lakes of Ontario, Michigan and Superior. So that's a little bit of update from the Great Lakes. Look at the climate outlooks. Um, El Nino is one of the big stories. Uh, and then we'll kind of step out from the short term out to the winter through the winter season as far as uh, what we know on temperature and precipitation outlook. <clears throat> First, starting with El Nino, we have very high confidence right now that uh, El Nino conditions are going to continue into the spring season. Um, 75 to 85% chance of that becoming a strong event at some point uh, between now and then. Um, even furthermore, uh, the latest discussion from the Climate Prediction Center indicates there's a three in 10 chance of this season's El Nino becoming what they call a historically strong event, um, which could compare to uh, the winters of 2015-16, uh, 1997, 98, and 82 to 83. So um, certainly looking at September uh, indicators, that is what they're looking at um, to, to say, wow, this could be a real, real strong event. Um, one note though, is that just because we see a very strong El Nino uh, potential, that doesn't necessarily mean we have stronger uh, impacts. Every El Nino winter is, is different. Um, and I'll show some, some maps to show that too. But in general, this globe here on the left indicates the general wintertime El Nino pattern with polar jet stream to the north and that Pacific jet stream more active to the south, bringing wetter conditions to the south um, and warmer conditions up here in the northern, north central states in general, um, looking at El Nino patterns. <clears throat> But historically, if we look at every El Nino season um, from 1950 to, um, to 2009, I believe, let me check ahead. Um, <clears throat> we, we have seen uh, some variability in El Nino patterns as far as temperature and precipitation go. Um, looking at that, we are facing a strong El Nino uh, this coming winter. 
I drew some red boxes around the strong events. These are ranked from strong to weak. And th this is from the, the climate uh, ENSO blog at climate.gov. And so when you look at the strong events there, the top uh, six, six maps there, more often than not, there's a pretty strong warm temperature trend or signal, I should say, um, in those uh, El Nino events in the strong category. So that's partly what we'll be leaning on for the outlook. On the precipitation side, um, not as clear a signal on precipitation. You don't really see that in, in most of our region. Um, some hinting towards wetter, some hinting towards drier historically. So not, not necessarily a very strong consensus, except we do see maybe some more, more dryness in the Ohio River Valley, for example. Um, but in the northern and western side of our region anyway, um, a little more of a mixed bag as far as winter precipitation goes. And winter in this case means December, January, and February, those three months. So keep that in mind as we look out ahead in the outlook. Um, we'll put a pause on the El Nino discussion for just a second, but looking at the short term here in the next seven day uh, pre total precipitation forecast, this is October 19th, 19th through 26th. Uh, we do see a very wet pattern setting up uh, from Texas all the way up to the Great Lakes, um, partly um, due to uh, a hurricane out in the East Pacific, uh, or it could see some remnants of that um, moisture come up through our region and, um, and converging with um, some cold air coming from the north that could be uh, troublesome in our region. But certainly looking at some wetter conditions, those purple colors, um, do indicate, you know, could be a couple inches or more, um, depending where you're at, of total moisture. So we're looking at um, eight to 14 days from now, and this was issued yesterday afternoon. That's the most recent information we have. There will be another update to these maps this afternoon, uh, shortly after this webinar has ended, I think. Um, but here looking at eight to 14 days out. So the last week of October, essentially, you see on the left, uh, pretty, pretty good confidence of below average temperatures, especially centered over Montana, the Eastern Dakota, or sorry, Western Dakotas um, for that last week in October. But certainly the region overall is favored or leaning towards below average temperatures for that period. And as we look on the right, that's the precipitation side. Um, and as we just saw on the seven day map, hints at a very wet pattern, <coughs> excuse me, from Texas up to the Great Lakes. Um, and certainly that there's some residual of that in that eight to 14 day, that, that second week um, or the week after that. Um, still leaning towards wetter though, um, across almost all of our region here in the North Central States. So if we combine that cold air, that Arctic air coming down from, from Canada, combined with a wetter uh, pattern in general expected next week, that those two factors come in together to increase our risk of snow. And so this was our map from yesterday's hazard outlook, um, looking at the, that October 26th to 27th timeframe, again, respecting Expecting some cold temperatures around that same time, the 26th to 29th, something around that. Um, and also looking at some wind risk as well. So uh, this would be probably our first winter event of the season, first significant winter event of the season. So certainly something to keep an eye on. Uh, it's still about a week out. And um, so pretty early yet, and this is again, just a slight risk, but I think the cold temperatures are really gonna be a story with the potential of getting down into the teens um, or colder in some, especially some of the Northern parts of our region. So that could affect winter wheat, for example, um, and definitely time to get ready for winter, no matter what happens, we're gonna see a significant change in the weather uh, next week. Looking at November then, uh, this is the uh, information released just this morning. Um, across the southern part of our region, we do have enhanced chances of warmer than average in the month of November. Um, and that kind of goes up into the western states, but over most of our region, equal chances 
of warmer, cooler, or near average temperature for the month of November. Um, so not, not uh, much of clear consensus among the models or forecasters as to which way we'll go on temperature for the month of November overall. On precipitation on the right, um, we do see some enhanced chances of below average precipitation in November in the um, uh, Great Lakes area. Um, but other than that, most of the rest of our region, again, um, equal chances of wetter, drier, or near average precipitation for the month of November. So one thing that maybe prepare for be for some ups and downs um, uh, in both temperature and precipitation, there's a fair bit of uncertainty in the outlook um, on both sides. <clears throat> Looking at November through January and those three months overall, uh, we see uh, uh, tilt towards warmer temperatures here uh, in the northern states. And so this is, again, consistent with that El Nino uh, historical pattern that I showed a few slides ago, if you recall that, especially looking at a strong El Nino, um, favoring warmer temperatures across the northern states. And that is reflected in the seasonal temperature outlook on the left. Um, similarly, on the right, um, they do have uh, increased risk of below average precipitation over some of the Great Lakes region, but they also included um, some of the Northwest uh, Northwest region there, Northern Rockies and, and kind of cutting across the Northern Plains region as well. So that is their outlook for November through January. To step ahead to the winter outlook uh, that was just released this morning as well. So this is December through February, that three month period. Um, very similar to the um, outlook that we showed for November th through January. Um, stepping ahead to December through February now, <clears throat> we see that that area again favored to be warmer uh, than average across the northern states. And they also um, pulled out a, a gray shading that they don't often show, and that's showing some confidence there in near normal temperatures uh, in parts of the southern plains. Um, New Mexico, Colorado, um, that shows there that uh, chances are higher or more favored for near normal temperatures than either below or above or, or warmer or cooler temperatures. So um, they have some, some degree of, of confidence there. On the precipitation side, on the right side, uh, you see a very similar pattern uh, to the previous outlook map with uh, drier conditions favored, favored in the Northern Rockies and the Great Lakes region and wetter across the South. Again, uh, very consistent with uh, what we've seen historically with El Nino winters. Um, get the question a lot about El Nino uh, snowfall season. And on the top map, this is from an article that was published um, a few years ago. Uh, from NOAA's in their in their ENSO blog, their climate.gov blog. Um, so this is looking at 1950 through 2009. Um, but when we look at the 10 strongest El Nino events at the top map, um, generally we have less snow uh, than average across most, most of our region. Um, and when you look at the bottom map, that's looking at all, Nino, all El Nino winters. Um, as far as looking at their snow season, which is October through April. So we look at all, all El Nino events. Um, again, generally less snowfall than, than average in the Northern states. I think a lot of this, um, you know, just from conversation, what I've read is that this is typically due to the warmer temperatures. Um, so you get less snowfall with those warmer temperatures, um, not just because you get less precipitation necessarily. All right, so just a snapshot, some key messages. Um, we do see drought continuing um, in, in some of our region. We'll expect, we, we are seeing some, or expecting some short-term relief uh, with the storm system projected to come up next week. Um, could improve the drought situation, certainly replenish our soil moistures. As we have El Nino conditions in play for the winter, um, with warmer conditions expected, or at least uh, projected, could see more areas this winter with less snow cover or no snow cover, and um, 
could provide more opportunity to gain soil moisture, some of those rain events that could come late this season or early next season. Um, but also, you know, there's kind of a flip side to that where you have an open winter, you can also lose moisture as well to evaporation uh, on those warmer days in the fall and spring. So it's kind of a, a, a push and pull of that, but um, some opportunity for sure um, for some soil moisture improvement with uh, less snowpack in the winter. And we do expect those El Nino conditions to continue through the winter into the spring season. And for more information on the winter outlook, um, there's a link there for the news information uh, from NOAA on their, on their climate uh, blog as well. So you can look at that for more details on the winter outlook. Um, with that, um, Here's our contact information for myself and Brad, which I'm sure he'll have in his slides too. And I had a lot to talk about there, so hopefully I covered it all, Doug. <laughs> uh, yes, you did. Um, can you go back real quick? If someone, whoop. Can you go back to uh, the central region uh, drought map real quick? Sure. The D1 through 4. Yeah. Uh, you can, you can find this by the way, uh, you can find this map for yourself by uh, just typing in drought monitor or US, US drought monitor on Google, it'll find it. Um, and you can parse it out however you'd like to. <clears throat> I'm not sure what part of that you wanted to see speci let's see, specifically, uh, we can always bring it up at the end of the conference or at the end of the uh, presentation as well. Um, yeah, so we won't discuss things right now. We're gonna change presenters and get Brad up here. Brad is with USDA uh, Office of the Chief Economist out of DC, but uh, uh, he does do a lot of agricultural analysis and obviously goes out to the field and speaks to a lot of different folks. So Brad, there you are, um, take it away. All right, I'm assuming you can see the screen all right, so I will yeah. jump right in. Yep. I know we're getting tight on time, so I'll try to roll through this. I'm glad your voice held out, Laura. Made it through your 35 minutes here. So yeah, we're starting to travel again a little bit in this post-COVID era, getting out from under the shadow a little bit. So last month I was in West Fargo for the Big Iron Farm Show. Got a chance to talk a little bit about the upcoming, well, pretty much what Laura just talked about. So it was good to be traveling again and, and back out in the Midwest. See here, I'm having trouble getting advanced. There we go. Laura didn't talk too much about the specifics on the Mississippi River, so I've got a few slides on that. And interestingly, it's deja vu from 2022. We have actually set a number of records in the last week or so that were set modern day low water records in the Mississippi, all the way from where the Ohio River meets the Mississippi, just below Cairo, Illinois down through all the way past Memphis, Tennessee. And so modern day record in Cairo, it's, a, it's actually the lowest since 1901, if you go way back in the records before dam control was a thing. We've dropped below that back on October 13th. And then all the gauging points from New Madrid, Missouri, all the way down through Carothersville, Missouri, Osceola, Arkansas, and on down to Memphis, Tennessee. All of those just in the last few days have dropped more than a foot below the levels that we saw in 2022. That's a reflection of both long and short-term drought. Remember that from last year's discussion, something on the order of 60% of the runoff into the lower Mississippi comes out of the Ohio basin. And so when it turns dry a few weeks ago in that basin, across the Eastern Corn Belt and the Ohio River, it's really dried up the water coming down from there. And that's one of the big contributors along with the longer term drought from other parts of the basin. And so we are seeing these records uh, that are pretty unprecedented except for last year and this year. Now, some of the highlights getting into the agricultural part of the story, I just talked about the records. This is the second year in a row we've seen records like this, just as the corn and soybean harvests are getting well underway. Typically about 60% of all the grain coming from the US that's being exported moves through the port of New Orleans. So it is a significant highway for agricultural products. There's also a lot of things that come northbound like fertilizer. 
At this point, we are seeing low shipping volume on the river. That is due to a number of factors. A lot of folks that are harvesting corn and soybeans at this point, grain and oil seeds, are storing it. So until storage runs out, they're just piling it up, putting it in silos, putting it in parking lots, and waiting for more favorable shipping conditions because that's the cheapest, fastest, and easiest way to move that to the south. There's also other factors at play. Um, and so there are some ex pretty soft export demand right now, but parts of South America coming off a bumper crop. So there's other factors as well, but right now we don't see a whole lot of volume on the river. Where we do see the volume though, where we do see uh, boats moving down, we are seeing a reduction in the load and a reduction in the number of barges that are being pushed along. So if you look at a, a typical barge equipment, if you have a tow hauling 15 barges, that's carry, that can carry almost a million bushels of grain. So that is a pretty impressive amount of cargo that can come down the equivalent of 70 truckloads. So that is uh, something that we may have to continue to deal with as we move on through until the drought breaks and we get some better flows. We need some big storms especially in the eastern part of the basin to, to help with that water flow. Now for the week of October 17th, it's interesting because the spot freight rate at St. Louis is actually pretty low. It's below the five-year average and a far cry from last year. And again, I think with a year to prepare, I think folks knew this could be a problem a second year in a row. They're handling it a little bit differently. Sometimes the markets respond more to threats than actualities. And so last year, this kind of caught everybody by surprise a little bit, I feel like. This year, folks were more prepared, so they are storing their crops. And they're also perhaps exploring other options, such as train or truck to move that grain and the oil seeds. So shippers at this point, mostly looking at ways to keep their grain off the river and just waiting for conditions to improve. And then if you look at the uh, the Downbound grain barges and number of tons, again, we're, we're below that five-year average at this point, but there could be a backlog in the future. So that is something to keep an eye on over the next few months. We always see improvement by February, but historically we still sometimes see very low water levels on through November, December, and sometimes a little beyond that. So this is an evolving situation. It changes week by week, it seems like. So stay tuned if you're if you're following along with this uh, river, low river level situation. All right, kind of a little recap, very short. I don't have a whole lot of time, so it's gonna be the, uh, the executive summary here. We did see minimal heat stress in the Eastern Corn Belt. Laura talked about the growing degree days being at or even a little below normal in the Eastern Corn Belt. It was hotter and we did see some significant heat waves in Western production areas. We did see drought cutting crop prospects, especially in the upper Mississippi Valley states. With corn acreage way up this year, we actually saw corn production in the US virtually tied with the 2016 and 2021 records. We did see much improved conditions in the High Plains region. Some of our Western states, as you move into Colorado, Wyoming, parts of the Dakotas, especially in the Southwestern part of North Dakota and parts of South Dakota, we did see significantly improved conditions from the previous year. And that helps some of the crops that are more grown out in that direction, such as sorghum. Now, commodity prices are actually down from a year ago. Again, very complicated, partly due to easing of inflation, but also other factors such as South American production, as well as sort of a, you wanna call it this, a stabilization of global affairs, meaning that War was new a year ago in the Russia-Ukraine region, but now it's just kind of it's slogging along and it's kind of just built into the markets. Speaking of, of crop prices, just one slide on this. You can see that corn prices, and I've labeled the, the most recent years, so it makes it a little easier. Corn prices way below where we were sitting at a year ago when we were close to $7 per bushel. And that's down in, in the 4 to $5 range right now. Soybeans were hurt a little bit more by heat and drought this year in the US. And so the prices for soybeans were a lot closer to what we saw a year ago. Wheat, that's really the, the example there of kind of stabilization of global conflict there because we've seen a falling of wheat prices. Doesn't mean we had a great crop out of the US. It just, it just kind of means we're, we're kind of slogging along status quo there. 
So prices are down considerably from when that conflict started. The uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict started when that yellowish or mustard-colored line jumped up there in the spring of 2021. And then one interesting note is that the steer prices, the cattle price, is one thing that is way up from last year. And we continue to see a contraction of the U.S. herd due to long-term drought in a lot of key production areas. And so we continue to push those prices higher. So that's kind of bucking the overall trend of prices. Just a quick look, I show this every year, but it's the risk management agency's crop indemnities. You can see that not a whole lot showing up there from the Mississippi Valley eastward, a lot of the problems further west. Some of that is wheat on the Great Plains, especially as you move into Kansas. And then we did see some uh, summer issues further north. So again, a lot of the indemnities focused in the western part of the region. Laura talked a lot about the, the drought and the issues, the fact that places where it's raining, it's not really running off, it's just helping to replenish soil moisture, generally speaking. We have had those events recently across the north. So you can see the numbers are pretty good in South Dakota, for example. And in brackets, that's a comparison to the same time a year ago. So nationally, 47% very short to short on topsoil moisture in the agricultural lands. That compares to 65% this time a year ago. South Dakota, then 19%, pretty low on the topsoil moisture, very short to short. 80% was the number a year ago. So you can see, generally speaking, a lot of those areas in the West have improved. And generally speaking, you know, a lot of areas have improved from this time a year ago in our region. Now, if you look at the national plot here, I told you 47% is the national number. We've been as high as 58% this year, but falling short of our very short to short rating at the peak in 2022, where we topped out at 68%. Subsoil moisture, this is a big part of the river situation. The fact that we just don't have any deep moisture and not, not a lot going into runoff at this point. So these numbers tend to be a little higher than the topsoil moisture. This is looking at ag areas below the six inch level of soil. And so some really big numbers coming in out of the, uh, the Corn Belt states, 74% in Iowa, for example, that's higher than this time a year ago. So yeah, we've still got a lot of long-term issues uh, spread across pretty evenly in many areas. Even states that have been wet, like Colorado and Wyoming, still have some long-term subsoil moisture shortages. That 55% nationally still is below last year's 65%, but that of the last 10 years or nine years, that's the only other year, 2022, where we had a higher subsoil moisture number for this time of year. We step through a couple of the major crops and start off with corn. The yellow numbers represent the typical or the 2017 ag census percentage of U.S. production. So Iowa, the number one corn producing state, 17% of the 2017 production. The in major minor areas, dark green and light green respectively, all those green shaded areas account for 99% of U.S. corn production. Here's the corn yield over the last uh, 30 years or so. Kind of interesting, since we emerged from the drought of 2012 and 13, corn yields have been very, very flat in the US. Compared to the trend line, which is going from the, the mid 120s 30 years ago up to uh, close to 180 now, we've really seen a flattening of the corn yield trend line over the last 10 years. We've not had a record in many, many years now, going all the way back to uh, 2017, I believe it was. And we've dropped two years in a row. And that's a reflection of just some of the weather challenges we've faced in the Midwest over the last 10 years. We've had some regional disasters like the Northern Plains droughts of 2017 and 21. And it's just been a, a series of what I would call imperfect growing seasons. It hasn't been awful, but it hasn't been good either. So we have, we've seen this flat trend line for corn. Even with that, we, with the October numbers that came out from USDA's Ag Statistics Service, we have potential corn yield records for 2023 in Indiana, 197 bushels an acre, and Ohio at 195, reflecting that somewhat cooler weather, even though dry at times and dry recently, but that, that real dryness came in too late to hurt the corn crop significantly. Our corn yield change state by state compared to last year. So the caveat being you are comparing to last year, which was a drought year, especially in the Western Corn Belt. 
even so, we had lower yields, at least in this, this initial estimate here, compared to last year in all of the upper Mississippi Valley states, Missouri, Illinois, northward through Wisconsin, and Minnesota, significantly lower in Missouri, which was hit early and often by drought and heat. Even Iowa with its dry spots in the east, looks like it might pull 199 bushels per acre, which is pretty impressive and probably a testament to the fact that we didn't see any brutal heat waves or long lasting heat waves. And the fact that today's varieties are pretty tolerant of drought and not so much heat. So uh, again, an imperfect growing season with a, a lot of challenges, especially in the upper Mississippi Valley. Corn production, because acreage was way up this year, looks like about 15.1 billion bushels, which is virtually tied with record set in 2016 and 2021. Now, in terms of corn conditions, you can see where it struggled. These are the good to excellent ratings, and the comparison is also to last year. You see the mighty struggle in states like Kansas and Missouri, and then even extending northward through Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, to some degree, Illinois, certainly um, less than optimal. 53% good to excellent is the national rating. And then in terms of very poor to poor uh, numbers, the states hurt the most and, and by perceived condition, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri, top of that list, 38% of the crop rated very poor to poor in the final report of the season and almost one fifth of the national crop. Corn harvest is well underway, almost halfway complete by mid-October. And like Laura alluded to, it's things are further along in the Western Corn Belt, more than 10 percentage points ahead of the five-year average in Minnesota and Iowa, but lagging a bit, especially in Indiana, 10 points behind the typical five-year average mid-October of 40%. So you see that kind of divide between East and West in terms of crop progress. Soybeans, same thing there. There's your typical state contribution to the national numbers. Illinois, Indiana, the, the two biggest states by far. And soybeans were hurt, perhaps even a little bit more than corn this year. And so we've seen steady to declining yields two years in a row, just like, just like uh, corn. And we've seen that pretty flat trend line over the last decade as well for soybeans with, um, you know, it's been many years since we've set a record for soybeans. That's unusual in this day and age where you typically see pretty fast rising yields from year to year. Still, we have potential yield records in Indiana and Ohio, same two states there, performing a little better this year. And then your comparison to the previous year, the same Mississippi Valley states all hurt to some degree by drought and occasional heat. And then we throw North Dakota and Kansas into that mix along, as well as Michigan. So uh, just a, a little tough year for a lot of the soybean country there, as we just, again, had imperfect conditions, just not enough rain and a little bit too much heat in the West. Soybean production down a lot, and part of that's the yield reduction. Part of that is area reduction. So it's going to be the smallest soybean crop in the U.S. since 2019, helping to support those prices a little higher as compared to corn. Soybean conditions like corn struggling a bit, 52% good to excellent nationally. Almost all the Western states there, everything from Missouri, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Michigan for that matter, westward all below that national average as heat and drought in the West cut the yield potential. And then very poor to poor numbers, really tough year for Kansas. Everything just hit all the wrong time there. 49% very poor to poor. And we also see at least a quarter of the crop rated very poor to poor in Nebraska and Missouri in the final report of the season on October 15th. Soybean progress with the mostly wide open weather, producers love to go after the more fragile soybeans quickly, and that's exactly what we've seen happening. So I was basically three quarter, three quarters complete by mid-October, 74%, 20 points ahead of the five-year average. And that drought affected Kansas crop coming out quick too. 23 points ahead of the five-year average there. Quickly, sorghum was just hammered by drought last year. Kansas is by far and away the biggest producer of sorghum. This year, good to excellent ratings. Not great, but better than last year, which was just a terrible crop. But uh, Kansas still hurt to some degree by some of that uh, heat that really got intense at times uh, moving into August with some 110 degree readings. 
And sorghum progress, they've passed the halfway mark on harvest. Although some of the Western production areas, including Colorado, a little slow. It's been a cooler, wetter summer, at least until recently there. Other quick highlights, spring wheat, it looked good for a while. Condition trailed off late in the year. Yield only down a percent from 2022. Production was up on a higher area. Durham wheat did get hurt. Almost all that crop comes out of North Dakota and Montana. We saw yield down 9% from last year, production down 7%. Last year wasn't great either. Sunflower production was down 22%, but that was mainly a area reduction, only 1% down on yield. Sugar beet yield and production both down 6% from last year. And then winter wheat, kind of an interesting story. I'm gonna talk more about that here in just a minute as we kind of finish up the old season and move into the new season. But abandonment for winter wheat was a record high, or at least a 100 year, 102 year record high with a third of the crop abandoned in the spring of 2023. And then an important point for livestock is that with the better weather and some of the high plains areas moving into Colorado, Wyoming and, and Western Dakotas, hay production improved this year. Uh, yield was up 3%, production up 8% as more land came back into production with the drought easing in some of those Western, far Western areas. So winter wheat, a little focus on there before I finish up. Biggest state for winter wheat is Kansas, and then a number of states across the plains and Midwest produce smaller amounts of wheat. Here's the abandonment numbers, almost 33%. I, I was wrong on my math. It's actually the highest abandonment since 1917, so that's 106 years. There's other reasons for that besides weather. There's, there's relief programs, uh, insurance programs that have pushed that up over time since the 60s, but still impressive to note that that abandonment was quite high. And that did expand up into Kansas, which is typically a lot of the abandonment comes from outside of our region down in Oklahoma and Texas, but it did include Kansas this year. Winter wheat yield, this is deceptive because this throws out the abandoned acreage. So you're throwing away all that zero down acreage. So maybe a deceptively high 50.6 bushels per acre this year, again, throwing out a third of the crop. We did see winter wheat yield records for the spring of 2023, though, in a number of our states, including Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, and then one state in the plains, Montana. So uh, actually a pretty impressive list there that emerged from a drought, uh, especially Montana, it's kind of impressive to put up a number like that. And here are the state numbers compared to the previous year. All the records have the hash mark beside the number. So I just went through all those. But a tough year for Kansas, unfortunately, tough year for the Dakotas compared to the previous year. So the overall picture was good, but you know, on a state by state level, it was highly mixed, highly variable. Now, as we look to the new winter wheat crop, just going into the ground, about two thirds of that crop planted by mid-October, the delayed harvest is slowing the planting in some of the Eastern areas like Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. So get a little bit late start, they gotta get the corn and soybeans out before the wheat can go in. Everybody else is moving along pretty quickly at or ahead of schedule for this time of year. And then emergence numbers are lagging a little bit. That's a reflection of the delayed planting in the east like Ohio, but then as you move further west, pockets of dryness say in, in Kansas affecting the emergence rates there. So we need rain in those driest areas where Laura showed the drought hanging around to improve the emergence establishment of that crop before it turns too cold for any further development. And we're still dealing, well, here's the overlay. So you can see where the major winter wheat areas overlay with current drought. We're still hanging around almost 50% of the winter wheat production area in drought as we move into this establishment season. So we really need to get some, some rains or snows into these drier areas to help get the crop established before the, it gets too cold. And there's the time series on that winter wheat and drought. We've been hanging right around that 50% mark all the way through the end of the previous season, right on through the period where there's nothing in the ground. And now that we're planting again, still hanging around on around 50%. And then finally, just wanna mention pasture and rangeland conditions. It's kind of interesting because some of our areas that are more drought prone in the West are actually doing pretty well. That's good news for next spring because if you have green grass now in the fall, you're probably gonna have pretty good growth in the spring. That would include some of our states like Colorado and Wyoming that have had a pretty decent wet season, a spring and summer wet season. So looking really good there. Almost two thirds of the rangeland and pasture are good to excellent in Colorado and South Dakota at this point. 
but then in the move into the Western Corn Belt, things are not looking so good. If you flip that to the very poor to poor ratings, you can really see Minnesota southward through Missouri and westward to Kansas kind of sticking out like a sore thumb. We need to get rains into there, get some of that pasture growth reestablished, or we'll have to wait until spring and probably have degraded conditions in the spring because it gets too cold to recover. So some to watch there as we head into the winter. Pasture range condition ending 2023, very middle of the pack, better than 2020, 2021, and 2022 in the drought of 2011-12, but still very middle of the pack if you look at the national numbers. And I believe last slide I have, talked about this before, we had some issues with fertilizer last year. Good news is prices on that have come way down from a year ago, almost 30%. But at the same time, if you're trying to replenish livestock and poultry stocks, we've had bird flu issues, both domestically and globally. So if you're trying to to buy livestock and poultry, prices are up 27% from last year. And with the livestock, that's partly due to the contraction of the US herd. So just depends on what you're trying to do on your farm, whether you're paying a lot more or a lot less compared to last year, throw it all together and it's basically unchanged from a year ago. And with that, I'll leave you with one more picture from the Big Iron Farm Show. We are past two o'clock, so I'll turn it back over to Doug and Dennis. Thank you very much, uh, Brad and Laura. Uh, really good uh, good briefings on both both issues, I guess you could say, or all the issues. Um, we have a number of questions, so I'm going to uh, and comments. So I'm going to go through those pretty quick. And Dennis, don't send me more notes there. Um, not so a lot of them were just comments, and so a lot not necessarily questions. So those of you who are uh, still tuned in, this should be relatively quick. Um, Let's see, will irrigation supplies for next season's crop be impacted by uh, low Mississippi river levels? Um, I think Dennis took a stab at that, uh, but that, that's a pretty complex question. So go ahead, Dennis, and, and say what you said. Or if Brad wants to chime in too, I mean, most of the area where we irrigate out of the Mississippi is, is south of the region. You get out into Missouri and there's some of it there. There's still a lot to happen. Uh, in the way of rainfall, in the way of potential runoff from winter precipitation. So it's a really hard call at this point. So, you know, there's really not a whole lot we can say at this point. Brad, do you have anything else to add? No, I agree. That's a, mostly a northern Mississippi Delta issue, which obviously extends up into the boot heel of Missouri. But yeah, it's a lot can happen between, I mean, obviously in the fall and winter, low river levels are going to be an issue. But by the time irrigation happens, it's, uh, We'll blame it on El Nino, no matter what happens. That's right. Everything will be blamed on El Nino, as you will soon see. Um, so um, I, I, I doubt there is much of a uh, uh, drop off with a lot of irrigation in the northern plains or Nebraska or anything like that in terms. But but there are definitely drop offs in, in rivers and streams. So I don't know how and I don't know if anybody's ever done a study to see if that kind of irrigation has any effect on long-term uh, river flows, especially on a giant river like the Mississippi. Okay, uh, moving on, um, we're, uh, uh, one commenter was very interested in uh, uh, drought and how deer populations uh, and viruses sort of uh, work together or, or didn't. Um, I won't go into that detail right now. Another question was, is snowfall, is more snowfall important for soil moisture recharge for this winter season due to the drought, uh, Dennis, <clears throat> Brad, Laura. Yeah, I mean, you could think of snowfall or, or snowpack on the ground as kind of a natural reservoir, so to speak, that kind of holds that moisture, or that, that water until we need it in the spring, right, when things start growing again. Um, so it could have some impact. You know, the other thing too is it will protect um you know the vegetation on the ground from extreme cold temperatures you know we still have winter even though we're looking at typically warmer than average overall could still see some cold uh, some cold periods so snowpack could also have the benefit of say protecting that winter wheat crop for example um so yeah there are a few benefits to having a little more snow on the ground but um spring rainfall is primarily you know fall recharge and then spring recharge are, are kind of the two big seasons Dennis can add or anybody else too. 
Yeah, and, and like up in Laura's area on some of the rangeland, if you get a big spring snowstorm, that can be beneficial to, to rangeland and, and, and uh, soils up there. Get down here in the main part of the Midwest and snow doesn't do a great deal for soil moisture recharge. Laura hit on a couple of the other issues related to it too. And I think Dennis, you also mentioned um, surface soil is, it's great for surface soil, but uh, deep soil moisture recharge is another question. Yeah, I mean, snow is good for surface water, uh, ponds, water, uh, you know, uh, uh, dugouts, um, right, and wetland areas, runoff into streams. It's great for that. And, and we the whole system, like Laura showed in the way of stream flow, we need lots of water in the system in a number of areas. So snow can be beneficial. It just doesn't do a ton for deeper soil moisture. Um, Brad. Has the correlation been studied between U.S. crop condition and crop yield? Has the gap between crop condition and crop yield narrowed over time? It's less than of a correlation than I would like it to be. So we've certainly had some, some bad condition corn years that turned out pretty well and vice versa. But it's still, I find it very interesting data to look at because it does tell you something. And uh, you probably don't want to do any kind of direct studies to, to take condition and turn it into yield, but I feel there's still a value there. I don't know if that even makes sense, but that's how I feel about it. All right. Uh, this is for the universe. Um, <laughs> I said, anybody from CPC still on? Raise your hand. Uh, why were temperatures so mild this growing season? Was there a dominant teleconnection? <laughs> We were coming off La Nina. I'll start and you guys fill in. We were coming off of La Nina, if you remember, the third year in a row of La Nina last uh, winter into spring. That sort of died away. We were in neutral conditions to begin the growing season and fairly quickly uh, moved into, if you will, a La, um, El Nino. Now, in terms of a teleconnection and what that meant, um, I can't tell you. Uh, and it may have nothing to do with it. Uh, but I'm sort of interested in um, uh, uh, anybody else's guesstimate on on any other mode that was in, in in charge, if you will, during this growing season. I'm trying to remember some of the things we, we started off pretty wet in the West, lots of uh, lots of activity uh, in the West. And then the high plains got really wet and the, the Midwest stayed pretty darn dry early growing season. A lot of east, northeasterly dry winds, um, very odd uh, pattern. Uh, most most folks at the Climate Prediction Center agreed with that. And very wet conditions along the Front Range out into Kansas uh, and north and, and to some degree south of there. Anybody? Yeah, Doug, this is Laura. I could yeah. add me a little, you know, here in the western part of the region, the Dakotas, we had a very late spring, you know, and we had snow on the ground here in northern South Dakota till almost May 1st. I think it was like April 29th. Um, so we had a very slow spring. Um, but I think, again, I haven't seen a, a diagnostic done or anything like that, you know, kind of analysis of the summer yet. Um, but we had a very quick turnaround to El Nino the summer, um, you know, earlier than we typically see that El Nino start. And so I don't know, just maybe thinking of that in mind, you know, that, that very rapid transition to what's looking like a strong El Nino um, could be a factor potentially. But I think looking at average temperatures too kind of masks a lot of the, the variability, a lot of the ups and downs. You know, we saw 100 degrees and then some very cold days or cold periods in between. There's a lot of, a lot of ups and downs, not just generally warmer all the time. Hey, Doug, this is Brad. Um, if anybody's on from CPC, they'll probably tell me I'm not right. But no, two of the most dominant synoptic things that we saw in North America in the summer of 2023 was the ridge across the deep south, the one that kept it so hot from, say, Arizona to Louisiana. Right. And we had a blocking high or a big high that was in the high latitudes. That's why Canada burned this summer, 40 million plus acres of boreal forest burned. Now, it seems like a lot of the U.S., at least our region, got caught in between that. And so it was 
depending on whether the northern the, the northern high built south or the southern high built north, that was those fluctuations Laura's talking about. It brought some of the, the weird north to northeasterly winds that Doug was talking about. And so we were kind of caught between these two high pressure systems, it seemed like for a lot of the summer. Hence it was weird weather. Weird. Weird is the best way to say it. And and we almost say it every year now. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that brings into mind some of these other webinars that we've held. We always were focused, I would say, May through August on smoke. Um, um, lots of smoke. Um, I believe lots of hail this year in areas, very particular areas. Um, but overall, maybe severe weather a little bit less, uh, depending on which kind of severe weather you want to talk about. Um, Anyway, um, then someone has a comment about lightning not being mentioned in this conversation. Does it have an effect? If so, do we know how impactful? Lightning being, um, yeah, so lightning is an artifact, if you will, of, 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 of thunderstorms, obviously. And I don't know if we had more or less thunderstorms than normal over that time. I don't think lightning in and of itself uh, is, is a factor, I guess you would say. It is more of an artifact of. Um, uh, of, of a weather system, I suppose, or a thunderstorm specifically. Any other comments? Yeah, just elaborate. Yeah, I can elaborate a little bit. So last I looked about a month, two weeks ago, a month ago, from the Storm Prediction Center, they keep track of uh, severe thunderstorm, tornado, hail, high wind, those kinds of events. And yeah, up here in, in the north central states, at least the northern plains, a much quieter uh, severe weather season as far as tornadoes and severe thunderstorm activity goes, um, but hail and wind was still kind of on par with, with average or typical. So um, yeah, I'd say lightning, you know, associated with severe thunderstorms and tornadoes, we had fewer of those up here. So um, definitely fewer than last year. <laughs> last year was very active, especially early in the season. And I want to end on this note. Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, we will be publishing, and I'll get to the question in just a minute. We will be publishing uh, three El Nino uh, briefings, uh, probably by the 9th of November or so. From uh, it's a collaboration of state climatologists and, and regional climate centers, and um, we'll talk a little bit about what El Nino means this year and what El Nino means generally in those uh, two-page briefs. Uh, we'll send. I'll send it out via my, uh, my my usual email list. If you're not on that, email me and I'll put you on it. Um, and the question was, and, and we could talk a little bit about El Nino because the question is, with El Nino warmth, is the risk higher for more intense rains in the spring, more rain on snow? And that's a super complex question, as it turns out, and no easy answers. What I'll I'll start by saying, and then others can can chime in, is looking at the seasonal forecast which laura did not show that go into the spring actually you can actually go one year ahead uh, out out one year for outlooks on a three month uh, uh a three months outlook uh, sort of scale anyway you could look at for example april may june uh of next year and see what cpc is thinking about that but uh it won't get into very specific uh, intense rains or anything. I won't get into a lot of uh, specifics about if there's going to be heavy rain or not. It's too, it's too far out to know that. That said, um, there are in, there are composites. But in, that, in other words, when we go back and look at all the El Ninos that have occurred, what what do they tend to do? Now, tend to do means maybe only 51% of the time, but there is a tendency for a wetter spring up from the southern southern plains, say up into uh, Nebraska, over into Iowa, and maybe Missouri, that kind of area. There's a tendency also for some dryness in the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes region. There is a tendency for warmth in the north, uh, in the northern plains. Brad, you're showing your your screen, um, and there is a tendency for dryness, uh, uh, wetness to our south and a little bit more dryness to the north and northwest. North, I'd just say the northern tier. I, 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 won't, I don't think I can comment on more intense rains this spring other than the fact that there has been a trend in that direction um, due to uh, probably climate change and among other things. Go ahead, anybody? 
Okay. <laughs> I, I think I've talked enough. Everybody else is uh, done talking, and I think we're about done. So thank you all very much. We will be back. Um, we will be back here on the 16th of November at 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, Lord knows who's going to be the presenter. It could even be Dennis and Doug. So we'll see what happens. So take, take care, everybody, um, and have a happy Halloween. Goodbye.